Check, check. How's everyone doing this morning? Was that not an awesome night last night? Come on. Well, we're excited to welcome you guys back for day two of the 222 conference, uh, the Great Communion Revival. Very excited for our lineup of speakers, worship leaders. We're just expectant. Dean was saying yesterday that he feels like this weekend, uh, there's a weightiness to it. And, and we all feel that in our spirit. It's not just a teaching or worship or moments of encounter, but there's weight to this weekend that I think will feel reverberate in the season to come. So I want to invite you guys to stand up together this morning. It's all across the room. Let's just stand. Let's just lift our hands together and just begin to invoke the presence of the Lord. Just over today, over this gathering, just begin to, in your own words. Father, we just say this morning, we thank you for the blood of Jesus that's been shed. That gives us great confidence. So this morning we invoke your presence, O oh Lord. We invoke the name of Jesus, the broken body and the shed blood. We worship you this morning. All across this room, I just want to invite you to lift your voices right now, just begin to sing in the spirit. Invoke the presence of the Lord. Some of you want to come up to the front, feel free. The invitation's there if you want to stay in your seat. Let's just invoke the presence of the Lord this morning.
sing to the Lamb seated on the throne. Come on, let's just sing our song to the Lord. Just lift our song of worship to the Lamb this morning.
Lord, we thank you this morning that we be, are invited to the mountain of the Lord to eat and drink with God, <laughs> to have a meal with God. We thank you, Lord, for the bread of heaven, the blood, the wine of your blood softens us, draws us into love with you and one another. We welcome you this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. This is what I want you to do. I want you to just go hug one another. Come on, that's, that's what you do. In the family, you hug. love here. Come on. All right. Let's come together. Well, thank you, Chayton, and the worship team. It means a lot to us that you'd come and lead us. And Hey, come in. The, and and that, that's my boy right there. That's my son, Jonathan. On the keyboard. Well, we're going to move right in to the teaching of the Word of the Lord. And I want to introduce to you a man named Matt Lockett. Maybe you've heard of him. Uh, very few men in my life touch me like this man. And just give a, a brief intro. It was in 2004, we gathered in Colorado Springs with about 70 mostly young people to pray and fast 50 days and 50 nights, praying for the ending of abortion. And a man that was living in, uh, in uh, Denver, who really wasn't, all, he was a believer, wasn't really connected with the issue of abortion. During that time or soon around that time, he had a dream and in the dream, in the dream, he saw a group of young people praying all night long with a whiteboard filled with abortion statistics. And in the dream, they had erasers, and Matt, you can clarify if I never get it right. And every time they would pray, they were slamming their eraser on the whiteboard with the abortion statistics. And in the dream, he comes to a guy he's never heard of, doesn't know who he is, but his name is Lou Ingle. This really makes me happy. That when people dream of me, and it's happened on several occasions that you don't know who I am, it makes me really happy that maybe God's thinking of me. And in the dream, he comes to this leader, Lou Engle, never heard of him, and says, how do these kids do this all night long? And he says, Lou Engle says, I don't know. And we hurl our erasers, and the whiteboard is not erased, it just turns white. <laughs> Matt Lockett, because of this dream, one of the greatest decisions in leadership that I've ever made, and that's not too many. <laughs> I put him in charge of him uh, to lead a movement called Bound for Life. For 18 years, they stood in front of the Supreme Court taking communion in blizzards and heat, praying a prayer, Jesus, I plead your blood over my sins and the sins of my nation, God and abortion and send revival to America. 18 years, Roe is no more. <laughs> give, give praise to God. Come on, give us, let's stand and let's give thanks. It was out of Colorado Springs. Hallelujah, we praise you. Just praise you. And, and though everyone was on the wall all across America doing what we had to do, I believe God answered that prayer, God and abortion legally. But the second part, I believe now we're in. Send revival. 
and it's connected to the blood, the great communion revival in Asbury. They're taking communion every day. Are we in the days of the answer to the second part of millions of prayers? God and divorce and sin revival, Matt Lockett, his wife, Kim, the f- deepest friends of our lives. Welcome, Matt Lockett. I love you, man. Thank you. Good morning. I told Esteban when uh, I got the schedule, nobody comes to the Saturday 9 a.m. session. I'm so happy right now. (laughs) All right, we're going to get set up here. Wonderful. June 24th, last year at 10.10 a.m. My team and I, at 10.10, I was there. We were standing in front of the court in life tape. You know, for, for years, we had dreamed of the day that Roe would be overturned. And I, I had this thought like, oh, what would it be like to be standing there at that moment? But then as the day approached, We knew it was coming. God told us it was done. We just then had to hold the line. And so all through last spring, every day there was an opinion coming out. We were standing there in life tape because I was not gonna miss it. (laughs) And so at 10, 10 a.m. on June 24th, there we were standing there, only about 12 of us surrounded by maybe over a thousand protesters that were screaming the most vile and obscene things you can imagine. And there we we stood victorious on a field of battle. And and uh, something really interesting happened. I wasn't gonna even talk about this, but you brought it up. Every, every time we went to the court for the last 18 years, we received communion uh, while we were there and we pled the blood of Jesus. We applied the blood to the doorposts of our national guilt. And w- that day was no different. So one of, one of the greatest things I think I've ever done in my life up to this point was to receive communion in front of the Supreme Court at 10, 10 a.m. on June 24th. The blood has accomplished its work. And just about 12 of us circled up and we were standing there. And something really interesting happened as we were, we were giving glory to Jesus and we were receiving the body and the blood. The pr- protesters began to circle us and shout the most vile obscenities, literally while we're receiving communion, just screaming in our ears, just all these vile obscenities. And the Lord took me back to that messianic Psalm where he's hanging on the cross and all of his bones are out of joint. And he says, oh, the the strong bulls of Bashan have come down and encircled me and the dogs have come. And that was nothing, but it was a little taste. Just, you know what I mean? It was just a little taste that just connected us to the Lord. Like, oh, what was it like for you hanging on the cross and, you know, abandoned, but by just a few standing far off and hell empties and all the demons and principalities come to gloat in victory, encircling him. They had no idea that they were reporting for their own judgment because they were disarmed at the cross. So they're screaming in our ears, and it's one of the happiest moments of my life. <laughs> in the months after, we, we were just wondering, God, uh, you, you did that. You did the thing that everybody said was impossible. What about the second half of the prayer? God end abortion, send revival. You say, oh, abortion hasn't ended in America. Well, we did the first part. The covenant with death has been annulled. And we move on from this place and we enforce the kingdom 
in every square inch of America that we can. But, you know, it's been, I don't know how many months since June now. What about that revival, God? And, and now I believe it's here. I just, you know, for the last two weeks, you know, I found myself asking, you know, what if this is it? What if this is it? I was in here last night. We didn't start the meeting last night. The meeting started itself. There's, there's, such, there's a pregnancy in this moment right now that those that have cried out for revival, it's like now you can't hold it back. I, I really believe this is it. I want to I want to just declare that in faith because we know you know we can see what's happening in Asbury but there I saw somebody sent me a list of all the universities it's a huge list of universities that have sent busloads of students to Asbury go get what's happening right there and bring it back here but it's happening spontaneously too and what was happening here last night was glorious but I was you know Friday nights are when uh, J-Hop, the Justice House of Prayer. That's when we meet on Capitol Hill and have our weekly gatherings. My team was texting me all through the night. They're like, the meeting won't stop. Revival's hit here too. <laughs> so I like you people, but I'm jealous for what's happening back there. <laughs> and you're getting the same reports, aren't you? I, I praise God. I just, I think, I think it's here. Well, I was given a job to do this morning, so I have to get going and get going quickly. Lou asked me to come teach on a very specific subject. How many of you know who Reese Howells is? Hmm, maybe only about half the room. Okay. Well, what I would like to do is uh, introduce to you this man a little bit, but... I've gone into great depth about this man, but I'm only going to be able to scratch the surface this morning. There's actually a lot that I feel like the Lord's put on my heart to share with you. We're going to kind of orbit around the topic of Reese Howes, but as much as I've studied what Reese Howes did, I want to do what Reese Howes did because I believe that we are in times right now that demand that we actually put into practice these principles. So Hebrews 13 Verses seven and eight says, remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God, consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. And then he adds this, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Of course, we're to put in remembrance the leaders that are before us in front of our eyes, the ones speaking the word of God to us. But we also have the benefit, if you're a student of history, to look at what the leaders uh, have said to us in the past. And I believe that Reese Howes is one of these men. A lot has been documented about his life. We have uh, a lot of resources that go into great detail. We can read the prayer journals of what was happening as this man and the company with him prayed. And so we have this encouragement here to consider the outcome of his way of life. Well, I don't know anything about Reese Howes. Listen, uh, Reese Howes, he was born in 1879, died in 1950. That window of time saw some of the greatest upheaval that the world, really the greatest upheaval that the world has ever known in terms of conflict and war. And God raised up a specially prepared man and company of intercessors to pray during and through those times. And what we see is this technicolor picture of a company of people who would pray and from the prayer room and from the place of intercession they were dictating the outcomes of war and civilization as we know it was saved because of their prayers and I, I agree with Dutch Sheets when he said that we cannot overestimate the impact that this company of people had on the destiny of the entire globe. So when we get the encouragement, consider the outcome of his way of life, I believe that we need to take this to heart, that we can look at the past and we can see a man praying in a time of conflict, world conflict, 
and we see the outcomes being dictated by the prayer room. So let's imitate this man's faith. And let's remember that the Jesus Christ that Reese Howes served is the same for him and he is the same for us, amen? All right, so this is Reese Howes, as I said, born 1879, died in 1950. And I wanna put before you uh, a statement that he made. I'm gonna leave it up because we're gonna to refer to it quite a bit. He said this, every creature must hear Therefore, the doors must be kept open. This is actually a profound statement. So before I go any further with Reese, I would like to share with you a dream. Uh, God uniquely uses dreams in our community and gives us uh, revelation, secret intelligence. And so we put a lot of value on dreams. So I actually wanna start this morning with a dream that we've just had recently. Uh, last year, as we were coming into that final stretch leading up to the overturning of Roe v. Wade, which we've spent the last 18 years focused on, really like hyper-focused, like laser focus on that. And then in March of last year, we went into a 40-day fast. This, would, this was our last fast before Roe was overturned. I regret no fast from the last 18 years kind of regret it in the middle of it. <laughs> but in retrospect, I regret no fast. <laughs> On the first day of that fast, I had this dream. I saw a dragon that was either walking or gliding around low in the air close to the ground. I didn't want to be seen, so I flew up really high. It couldn't see me, but I kept an eye on it like I was observing it. The way I was able to fly was by holding a large white plate out in front of me. And I would wave the plate up and down and it would lift me up from the ground. I could then steer through the air with this plate. And I flew up higher than the dragon and could look down upon him. The point of this dream was that uh, I knew in the dream that I had to keep an eye on the movement of this dragon. Well, even as Dean shared last night, one of my first thoughts was, you know, this is, you know, is this about the Revelation 12 dragon, you know, that, that gets cast down? And I was pondering that and it didn't, it didn't sit right. But I also didn't understand the big white plate. But two days later, uh, something very significant happened that gave me the interpretation of this dream. We were on a 40 day fast and on that fast, it, we were receiving communion every single day. That's something that had started in 2021, even as God was beginning to release revelation about a communion revival. And so on that 40 day fast, we were receiving communion every single day. And two days after this dream, my team and I were gathered around a table and my wife came out of the kitchen to serve the communion elements to our team. And she walks out with this big white plate with the elements on it and sets it down in the middle of us. And I, as soon as I saw it, I immediately remembered my dream. The white plate is communion. Communion is what elevates us. It lifts us up from the earth and gives us that heavenly vantage point. We get caught up. It's not as, as Dean was sharing and Lou was sharing last night. This isn't just symbolic. I believe that there is something tangible to this that we actually get caught up, lifted up into a heavenly vantage point. And then the Lord spoke to me, the dream is, or the dragon is China. Well, that caught me off guard. I didn't know, know what to do with it because we're praying for America, we're praying for the ending of abortion. And here it is, I'm on the last fast of that assignment and God is beginning to give me a glimpse at what we're to step into next. And I've said this for years that, you know, I would hear people refer to Roe v. Wade as Goliath. And I've always said this, that Roe v. Wade is not Goliath, but it probably is a lion or a bear. When David shows up and there is a giant that is taunting God's people, he doesn't just speak from bravado. 
He's not more macho than his brothers or anybody else. What you've got is an army that gets up every morning, eats breakfast, puts on their armor, and has no intention of fighting. And he shows up with a testimony. They said, who do you think you are? You're but a boy and he's been trained for war since he was a boy and he says, I don't know, but I fought a lion and a bear and God delivered me out of their hand and he will be no different. And so we're going into, I believe, a time of conflict And we, we need to know how to defeat lions and bears. I don't think bravado is going to get us through what's coming next. And I don't think just going through the motions of putting on our armor every day with no intention of fighting is, is the solution. But we do have this moment right now that Roe v. Wade was overturned. God did the impossible. And the cynics that are saying this Asbury revival is nothing, they think revival in America is impossible too. Well, God just did the other thing. Who are we to think that he's not gonna do the other two? He's the God of impossibilities. So I'm finishing that, I'm finishing off the bear. <laughs> And God gives me a glimpse of the next assignment. And I really do believe, I wanted to start there because this, this, what I'm about to share this morning, you know, Lou said, come teach about Reese. And then, you know, I saw that the, the theme of the conference is the great communion revival. And I was like, how's this gonna fit? And you know, and especially after last night where it's just presence and worship, and I turned around to David Kim, I go, how do you teach in this kind of environment? So I just pray right now, Father, let this make sense. Amen. We need a greater revelation of communion because conflicts are coming that will threaten the advancement of the gospel to the unreached and the unengaged. I believe what God was showing me in my dream is that communion is going to be this critical element that we, this greater revelation of communion is gonna be necessary to be able to face dragons. Even as uh, principalities and powers and earthly leaders in partnership with them would attempt to shut down the globe and stop the advancement of the gospel. You need a higher vantage point. You can't just slug it out on the ground. Well, let's go back to Reese. This quote, every creature must hear, therefore the doors must be kept open. Let's take a look at this next one here. Matthew 16, verse 19. Jesus, this is in the first mention of church, the ecclesia, that Jesus uh, mentions in the gospels. And he says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Wait a minute. This is very significant. Dean Briggs has literally written the book on the ecclesia. I would encourage you to get it. But he's directly referencing Isaiah 22, 22, right? that there, I'll give you the keys of the house of David. What you open, no man can shut. And what you shut, no man can open. Now Jesus is, he's inaugurating the church and he's drawing from that. He says, now I'm giving those keys to you and whatever you bind will be bound. Whatever you loose will be loose. Or in other words, in, in the Greek, whatever you permit will be permitted and whatever you forbid will be forbidden, but it's Isaiah 22, whatever you open will be open and whatever you close will be closed. So this is very significant with, as it relates to the advancement of the gospel, but it puts a lot of pressure on us because we have to know what to bind and what to lose. 
See, we don't come to this stuff presumptuously. We can't afford, there's too much at stake for us to start just shooting like cowboys, you know, just pew, 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 or just throwing up prayers, hoping that something sticks. You need the strategies of heaven. You needed them for the last season, but you really need them for the next season. You actually, you can't go without the strategies of heaven. And so this is exciting when we read this scripture. It's like, yeah, I want to be able to bind and loose things. Well, you need to know what needs to be bound. You need to know what needs to be loosed by heaven's dictates and not by our own political persuasion. Ouch. So there's this uh, beautiful little thing that's in the Reese Howells book. So there's a book called Reese Howells Intercessor. It was written by Norman Grubb in 1952, right after Reese died. How many of you have read that book? Fantastic. How many of you have read that book more than 10 times? See, this is how it works. You read, some books you read and they encourage you and you feel good for having read them. You read Reese Howell's Intercessor and you wonder whether or not you're even saved. And you put it away and then a year later, God brings it back before you. You read it again and it happens year after year after year. People, yeah, hang on. Here, here's the microphone. So my wife and I was reading it again. Uh, she, she, I'm, she's much kinder than I, but she, she picked up that book and she says, you're reading that book again? She hurls it against the wall because <laughs> she knows I'm about ready to do something stupid. I don't think she hurled it. She says I just tapped it or something. like. I think she hurled it because she knew this is going to create problems. That is a true statement right there. This book is going to create problems. But it says this in, in one part. It says, Reese Howells was struck at a young age when praying Psalm 2, which led him to pray through it every day for the rest of his life. This became a huge influence on him going to the mission field in Africa as he became willing to become the answer to his own prayers. So think about it. Here he is. He's praying Psalm 2 every day. And then he gets, he gets caught up in that storyline or whatever encounter he is, he's having with the Lord as he's praying through Psalm 2. And then he, his prayer then becomes, make the nations your heritage and the ends of your earth the ends of the earth, your possession. And then he becomes willing to be the answer to his own prayers. So he became a missionary in Africa for five years. But I, I, I saw that the other day as I was pondering what to share here. And I, the Lord just, Psalm 2, God was just like, focus on Psalm 2 for part of this. And so I want to dive into Psalm 2 with you this morning, if that's okay. I want to take a closer look at it. The book of Acts credits Psalm 2 as coming through the mouth of David by the Holy Spirit. Now, if you, uh, we're not going to, let's read the whole thing. I need a Bible. Thank you. The podium is small-ish. <laughs> Psalm 2, why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in heaven in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, as for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore, O kings, be wise. 
Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. I want to maybe offer to you a way to look at Psalm 2. It might be a little different than you're used to. I believe that Psalm 2 can be seen as the stage of history. And it's a stage with characters populating the stage. Psalm 2 has their speaking parts for what's happening on that stage. Verse 1 and 2 is David's voice. Verse 3 is the voice of rebellious kings and rulers. Verse 4 and 5 is back to David's voice. Verse 6 through 9 is the voice of God. And verse 10 through 12 is back to David's voice. This is a scene. This isn't just poetry. Listen, this isn't just poetry. This isn't just abstract thought. This is a scene on the stage of history. Can you see it? Literally, half of the, five of the, or what is it? F five of the 12 verses are in quotes. David is observing the conspiracy of earthly kings from a throne room vantage point. From there, he can see and hear their rebellious schemes and plans. He also hears what the father has to say in response to their wicked plans. This is stunning. Catch this. A human is standing in the heavenly throne room that presides over the affairs of man. There is an earth being in that scene, watching this, this scene of history play out. But David is not just a passive spectator. He's an active participant. The last three verses are not suddenly removed from this scene and spoken elsewhere. What do I mean by that? They cannot be, those last three verses cannot be limited to the idea that maybe, hopefully, at some crazy moment in your life, you'll get a chance to speak briefly to a world leader. So wait a minute, what's happening here? It suddenly shifts, the dialogue shifts, and David says, kiss the sun. And we've taken that out and we've put those last three verses as a, as a message of proclamation in the earth. But those last three verses are not removed from the scene. Do you see where I'm going with this? There's, he's still in the scene. He's still in the throne room vantage point when he begins to declare, kiss the sun over these world leaders. The world leaders that God is holding them in derision and he's mocking their petty little schemes and plans and they have no idea what's happening in the throne room scene that there's already a king on a throne and his secret identity is now revealed to those that are in there. The king on the throne is his son. And David's participation in the scene is to join in a partnership with God's authority and the king's authority over the affairs of men. How many of us in this room, would you guess, are going to get a chance to go talk to the governor? I see the shoulders shrugging. Probably, maybe none of us. So if you're holding out on some crazy moment in life that might come, that you're gonna get 15 seconds in a handshake line to speak truth to power. I don't think that's what this is about. This is an earth being in a higher vantage point. He's, he's got access to the throne room and he's partnering with the leadership of that place over the affairs of man. So when he says, when David says the last three verses, he's actually still there. This is a picture of intercession. This is a picture of our invitation to be in that place 
on the stage of history, partnering with heaven's leadership over the affairs of man. So maybe you'll get your shot. Maybe you'll get your Matthew 10 moment where you get dragged in front of a governor. That's what it says. Some of you will be dragged in front of governors and I will, don't worry about what you'll say in that moment for I will give it to you when you open your mouth. We just don't like the part where you're, you're dragged there. <laughs> so I don't think Psalm 2 is talking about Matthew 10. Psalm 2 is about intercession. You are called to be a participant in that scene. Elisha repeatedly eavesdropped on what the king of Syria was planning. Even when what he said in his bedroom, that wasn't, that wasn't even just a one-off, man. It actually, the scripture says there, this happened more than a couple times. Elisha was eavesdropping on what an enemy king was planning, what, his, what he was scheming in secret. Dean brought up last night, Zechariah is eavesdropping on a scene over Joshua the high priest, and he becomes an active participant in the scene. Put a new turban on his head. These are all describing what I believe is the exact same scene. Daniel had a dream and fasted, a disturbing dream and, had, and fasted 21 days. Strong angels pushed back the principality of Persia and gained prevailing influence over the human kings of Persia. That set in motion their release from exile. Over and over and over, we could give examples of this scene playing out. You have an invitation, yea, an even greater one because the, the curtain has been torn. You have access by faith with confidence to enter that place. The door of Revelation 4 never closed for you. Where John says, I saw a door standing open. That thing doesn't just randomly open and close and you hope you're in the right place at the right time. No, Jesus paid a price for that door to, to get knocked off its hinges. And you have access I believe Psalm 2 is a big part of what we need to come up into right now. Let's go back to that quote that I put up earlier, that every creature must hear, therefore the doors must remain open. <clears throat> when the first attempt was made by rulers to close a door for the gospel in Acts chapter 4, what was the response of the church? They prayed Psalm 2. Don't speak anymore in this name. That was an attempt to shut a door for the advancement of the gospel. And the church responded by praying Psalm 2. But I love what it says here. It says, and when they heard it, the, the report, they lifted up their voices together, it says, to God and said, sovereign Lord who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit. I really wanna highlight this part about doing this together. I believe that this isn't just your individual calling. I believe for us to have an accurate, as accurate as can be, understanding and revelation of what needs to be bound and what needs to be loosed, we need to do it corporately together. There's, there's safety in numbers, I believe, when it comes to this, that you get yourself connected to a team of people that are running with a common vision that want to touch this dimension and have authority over the affairs of man from heaven's vantage point. But God then begins to stir your hearts and connect you covenantally, and he pours out dreams and visions and revelation, and you begin to compare your notes. And suddenly you got part one of a dream, and I got part two, and you got part three, and we put it all together together and we're in that heavenly vantage point where we're, now we know what heaven's will is over the affairs of man. This is what was happening at the earliest days of the first church. Now here's a kicker. We are commanded to pray for kings 
in 1 Timothy 2, 1 to 4. But there are no apostolic prayers given to us to pray for them. That requires us to lean in for specific strategies. You are commanded to pray for kings, but there are no apostolic prayers in scripture to pray over them. That requires you to get specific strategies to pray. As world events are shifting and obstacles for the gospel are rising up in real time, you must get your prayers from the apostle. I tell you, we are entering into a season right now that is becoming so complex. And very few of us are foreign policy experts or educated missiologists. We do the best we can. But the complexity, it's, it's too much. You could spend the rest of your life just trying to get educated on it. But together we can step into a heavenly dimension and get the cheat codes for the whole thing. What does heaven want? What does God's leadership, what does the leadership of Jesus over world events look like if we dare to step into that dimension and hear an eavesdrop on the whole thing? And then from the place of intercession, we begin to come into agreement with it and release those decrees from that place. I can't say that I understood every prayer I ever prayed over Roe v. Wade, but I did the best I could in partnership with what I felt like God was saying in heaven. And all I know is that I have an outcome. Are you guys getting this? Okay. What I mean by no apostolic prayers, there, God's word is applicable in every situation, useful for everything, right? It's great. But if you need to know what's happening behind the scenes in China right now, you'd be pretty hard pressed to find a scripture to reveal that to you. But the scriptures command you to pray for Xi Jinping. What are you going to pray? You get this. You have to lean into that place so that you can hear what the apostle of your faith has to say about it. Go get the strategies of heaven and do it together as a team. Let me share another dream with you to kind of flesh this out a little bit. One of our team had this dream uh, last fall. He said, I was at what seemed like a church sanctuary. It was round and everything was white. The sanctuary was like the United Nations, meaning it looked physically, it looked like the United Nations, where a country would be represented by its leader and a few others. I saw Vladimir Putin and Russia's delegation. He was not far from where I was sitting. I could go in and out of this sanctuary whenever I wanted. One time I remember going out to the hallway to get water. After things had been going on in the sanctuary for a bit, Xi Jinping and his delegation from China came in and sat right behind me. People started trying to get pictures of them and he was accommodating for pictures for a brief bit, even smiling for some people for pictures with him. I tried to take a selfie with him, but it wouldn't work. As I tried to reverse the camera, it kept switching back to the forward view. I went out to the hallway again to try and make it work and it eventually switched I went back in and tried to get a picture even though he wasn't giving opportunities for pictures anymore. I want to break this down because I think this dream is profound. So the, here, uh, that's a picture of the United Nations in New York. This is what it looks like. It literally has like that round orientation with all of the, the leaders and their delegates 
that would come and gather in that place. But in uh, the, the, my team member that had the dream, in, the, in his dream, it, the whole thing was a circle around something in the center. And the whole place is white. Now, what does that sound like if it's the United Nations, but it's the whole environment is white? This sounds like a throne room with a lamb seated in the center. But in that place, world leaders, Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping and others, representatives and delegates of different nations around the globe are coming in and they're, they're in this place as well. But here's what I think is going on. God is saying that there is a throne room where literally you, will, you can have proximity to world leaders. Xi Jinping is the most isolated world leader on the planet right now. It's almost impenetrable what is around him in terms of intelligence and what he thinks and what he uh, is being told. And yet in this dream, he's right next to us. We, in, in that space, we have proximity to these world leaders. But then he gets out his phone and tries to take a selfie and it won't work. He's trying to turn, you know how it is when you hit the button and you turn the camera around to face you to take a selfie. He tries to switch it and it keeps flipping back to the forward view. He doesn't understand why it won't work. He has to go out of that place to get it to work. Let me just tell you right now, selfies won't work in the presence of God. I think what that whole thing is describing is literally you, you want access to world leaders. You want to be an influence over world history and the affairs of men. God's not going to let you stand in that place and focus on yourself. I think that's what the selfies are all about. You can take your selfies, but you're going to have to go out of that place to do it. And it may very well be that if you're so focused outside there to take selfies of you know, to focus on yourself. When you come back, you may have missed your opportunity because history keeps rolling. And I believe that we are called into strategic moments. And as he's telling me the dream, all I could think about was communion Colorado. This is a picture of the gathering last October. Lou did something that I have never seen anybody else do. He made communion and Jesus the centerpiece. He put it in the middle and there's your United Nations. And, sur and selfies don't work there. Because as we were gathered around there, Laura Park starts singing, I see a lamb seated on the throne all eyes on him and the chorus just erupts all eyes on him get your eyes off of yourself all eyes on him i believe what we did in that gathering it was we were scratching the surface we did it last night right here like don't take for granted what was happening last night we're scratching the surface of something that Moses peers into heaven and he sees a tabernacle and then he creates a tabernacle in the earth that follows that blueprint. And do you realize that David did the exact same thing? This author of Psalm 2, he gets the mercy seat and puts it in the center and he puts some prophetic seers around it who are surrounded by their sons. Now, go here with me for a second. Now he's got these three guys in First Chronicles 25. He's got Asaph, Heman, and Jedithan. And they're described as seers and prophetic and musically prophetic. But if you read the whole storyline back in chapter 15, he's got another guy named Kenaniah, who is also, he's actually played the guy that trained all the other dudes. So he's probably the best one among them, but he's also really good at other things. So 
He's not in this scene right now. And let me just say this. Every ministry needs at least one person that's good at admin work. <laughs> Amen, Esteban. <laughs> but now here's the picture. You have a mercy seat in the center. I believe four guys covered in eyes around it. And then it lists their sons around it. Count them. There's 24 sons. Well, where did David get that idea? It's almost kind of like David had a New Testament church right smack dab in the middle of the Old Testament. He puts the mercy seat in the center and he's got four living creatures around it and 24 elders around them. David was actually in a reality in Psalm 2. It's not poetry. It's a model. Psalm 2 is the model. Put the lamb in the center. And let's get some prophetic people peering into that and some sons that can carry that and execute what's being spoken in the earth. So what we did last night and what we did in October, it was just scratching the surface. What if, you know, you go to Europe, the old churches, man, it looks so extravagant, but it was designed architecturally to point people to God. These just magnificent cathedrals. Now all of our churches look exactly the same. We walk into a dark room, everything's painted black. Thank you, Pastor Todd, for hosting us here. <laughs> but all of our churches look the same because they're all designed for all eyes to be right here. What if what God is doing, go with me, Dean. What if what God is doing in this revival right now is going to impact the architecture of the church in America? What if we physically start building churches differently, Dean, where the lamb can be in the center? I loved what happened at Communion Colorado because the lamb was the centerpiece and the worship leaders were at the other end of the stadium and nobody was down there with them. <laughs> But the, the chorus is just ringing through the whole place. I see a lamb seated. You worship leaders, man, you better get used to this. All eyes should not be on you. Hmm. It would seem that we are no longer in a time of world peace. Many believe the Pax Americana, which means the peace of America, has ended. Or has at least begun to end as of August 2021. There are noticeable things that we can observe that what's happening right now has happened before. And if it's following a similar pattern that it is entirely predictable, what's going to happen next? Not everybody agrees on that. I'm only bringing it up to suggest that perhaps that has already occurred and we are now in that time. We are transitioning into what is called a multipolar world and dictators and despots are rising. Why am I bringing this up? The time in which we live runs parallel to the most central part of Reese Howell's life. For him, the world shifted from the Pax Britannica to a multipolar world in 1914 with the outbreak of World War I. So this is important if we're to be a student of Reese Howell's to understand the times in which he lived, that he lived through a parallel moment that we are living in right now, where the peace of a world power is, is lifting and conflict is rising and dictators were beginning to rise. So what's happening right now has happened before. Thankfully, it didn't surprise God and God was preparing in advance a man and a company of people who would be uniquely prepared to pray through those times. And I wanna say this to you right now. 
because we love the story of Esther. Listen, Reese Howes was for such a time as that. You are for such a time as this. So before that, you don't, don't let that sound like fatalism or like, man, I just don't even want to think about this. La, 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 la. You know what I mean? Like, don't go there. Like God prepared Reese uniquely and used him powerfully at a time when the whole globe went into upheaval. You were made for such a time as this. That means that you have an opportunity to be uniquely prepared for what's coming next. And the study of Reese Howe's life, I believe, is going to give us a lot of insight into what is coming next. Well, 10 years after that shift began to take place, Reese Howe started the Bible College of Wales in 1924. And for the purpose of, he did that for the purpose of training missionaries who could pray through the global obstacles that surrounded them in the changing world. You have to understand that the student volunteer movement, the SVM, you guys, students of revival and missions, or if you, you, let me just see some heads bobbing yes, if you know what I'm talking about when I say SVM. The student volunteer missions movement that began at the end of the 19th century and crossed over into the beginning of the 20th century, when the world went multipolar, it killed it. And this is what always happens, is when you go through this shift, it has a dramatic impact on missions and the advancement of the gospel. But Reese was prepared for such a time as that. And he started a school to train people how to pray through the obstacles, not turn tail and run away from them. Because what happened as a result to, uh, uh, back with the SVM is they turned inward and I won't call it a selfie, but they became focused on domestic issues, social activism, and uh, economic equity and racial matters. That's what happened. That was the result is when the walls went up around the world, the missions movement turned inward and they became focused on social activism, racial and economic equity. And so does that sound familiar? Reese started a school to not turn away from the obstacles, but actually to get heaven's perspective and plow through them. Because every creature has to hear, even in a multipolar world, therefore the doors must be kept open. That when dictators and despots want to close the doors, God releases a key to his people. What you open, no man can shut. So Reese started a school to do that. And this is what, in, in the days leading up to it, he was shouting the message that we need schools to teach our young people how to do this. This is what's needed right now. We need schools all across America to train young people in how to pray through the challenges that are coming next. Doesn't have to all be young people. Get some old people too. Don't forget Gen X. Everybody forgets Gen X, don't they? I want a piece of this. <laughs> Reese Howes received, let me take you through a little bit of a, a progression of history here. Reese Howes received the Every Creature Vision on December 26th, 1934. The Every Creature Vision was his commissioning to be responsible for the completion of the Great Commission. So they called it the Every Creature Vision. He got it on December 26, 1934. He launched the initiative on January 1st, 1935. Almost immediately, insurmountable challenges formed that threatened the spread of the gospel. I can't ignore the, the way these things line up on the stage of history, that God releases a vision for the completion of the, of the Great Commission in a generation and immediately dictators start rising. Systems and conflicts rise to hold back God and his fulfillment of this through his people. The first test came in March, 1936, when Hitler violated the Treaty of Versailles. The Treaty of Versailles is, that, was the, that came at the end of World War I, which disarmed Germany. Uh, they lost a lot of land and Hitler defied that treaty and he reoccupied the Rhineland. Well, in the days leading up to that, 
the Lord spoke to Reese Howes and he told him, prevail against Hitler. So this is a quote here, prevail against Hitler, he said to me, and it meant three weeks of prayer and fasting. They prayed great travail through those days as Hitler was making those moves. And then on March 29th, Reese came in to the prayer meeting and he made this startling announcement. He declared, prayer has failed. We are on slippery ground. Only intercession will avail. God is calling for intercessors, men and women who will lay their lives on the altar to fight the devil as really as they would have to fight the enemy on the Western front. That's a hard call. But I wanna, I wanna respond to that kind of a call that we wouldn't just leave the outcome of these things that are happening around the globe to be solved by presidents and Congress and military engagements. Don't let them do more than you do in the prayer room. You're called up into this Psalm 2 dimension to rule with Christ over the affairs of man, to be an influence over kings and rulers, dictators. The next test came right after that when Mussolini invaded Abyssinia, which is Ethiopia. They knew that Mussolini was not to take, God told them he's not to take Ethiopia, and then he did. And so when the thing happened that they prayed wouldn't happen, they walked in, Reese walked in and he described that how they had experienced death in intercession. God is preparing them for the conflicts in the days ahead. And part of that preparation involved learning how to lose. Now, after the, the, the days after Roe v. Wade was overturned, I sat down with my team really for weeks and months and we started just kind of like trying to make sense like what just happened and after a lot of discussion and prayer I, we kind of distilled it down to one thought that you have to learn how to lose you have to learn how to lose and remain faithful to the end scripturally we know Daniel 7, there are times when an antichrist is going to make war against the saints and be prevailing against them. He, there's a time that he will be winning until God did something big and a verdict is rendered in favor of the saints. We need to learn how to lose. You need, you need to know how to get the right strategies out of heaven. You need to be able to learn what works and what doesn't work. And that takes a little trial and error. And I'm not saying they were experimenting here, but I'm just saying that there is this dimension that not every prayer happens the way you think it should happen. Not every prayer gets answered in the way that you know God wants it to happen. In this case, they're praying and travailing and Hitler's tanks are still rolling. What is going on? The next test came in the summer of 1938 when Hitler began to make aggressive moves concerning Czechoslovakia. This is all before World War II. Now, grace, grace, grace. I slept through history class. I know you did too. That's why I'm, I'm not really like burdening you with a bunch of dates because I know that's what we all did right in class is you memorize the dates, you take the quiz, and then you immediately forget everything you just learned. That's not the goal here. What I'm wanting you to catch is the storyline. That God has them battling out these things in prayer with foreknowledge of what's really going on. There are characters on that stage that still were trying to make peace with Hitler. There were leaders still trying to reach compromises with Hitler and Mussolini not rightly discerning the moment that they were living in. Peace at all cost. It makes me wonder, oh, hear me now, stone me later. Like through this season that we've just come through, like is this what we've been doing in the church is 
rather than engage in the battles with foreknowledge, we've been just trying to appease the devil and make compromises for peace. Just get, just give him the Rhineland back. It was theirs before. Just give it back. Maybe we'll get peace if we just don't make a stir. Well, now he wants Austria. Well, let's let him annex all of Austria. Now he wants Czechoslovakia. Maybe we should do something. This isn't looking too good. So at the time, you've got Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain in, this is what they called the Munich crisis. I call it the Munich moment. The Prime Minister of Britain, Neville Chamberlain, and the Prime Minister of France, Deladier, they go to Munich to negotiate with Hitler, to try to make peace terms with that monster. And his lackey Mussolini is there trying to pick up the scraps. I say it that way because how many of you saw the movie Darkest Hour? Churchill called him his lackey. <laughs> oh, not many hands went up. You need to go watch Darkest Hour. You, this is your homework assignment. Watch Darkest Hour and Dunkirk in that order. So they go to Munich, they negotiate with Hitler, but God is speaking to Rees while this is all going on. They're in travail over these things because they know, prophetically, they know what's coming. Even though there is, there is a desire for peace, they know that something's coming and they get a prayer in that place. Lord, bend Hitler. This is what's recorded in the book is they pull that prayer out of heaven and they come into agreement. Bend Hitler in that Munich moment. Now, I want to read you an excerpt from Riesel's intercessor that describes this moment. Hitler signed this pact with Chamberlain and Deladier. It says Hitler felt irritated. Now this is from a memoir, an analysis that was written later by a military commander, or no, actually uh, 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 an ambassador to Germany. He said, Hitler felt irritated with himself. A section of his followers were always egging him on to fight England while England was militarily unprepared. They reproached him for having accepted the Munich settlement and thus having missed the most favorable opportunity. An uneasy feeling, lest they might have been right, contributed to Hitler's ill humor. He, mean, all this meaning he was really, really mad at himself after he did this. His voice, capital V voice, Hitler had a voice internally that talked to him. It's a demonic possession and it would tell him what to do where to go sometimes in defiance of his military commanders and he would be proven right again and again and and in the end his military commanders stood in awe and ab adoration of him because he was never wrong because the voice would tell him what to do it says his voice told him that there could be no more propitious moment for a war than that october which is just days away. And for once he had been obliged to disregard that voice and to listen to counsels of prudence. For the first time he had failed to obey his voice. He had acted on several occasions in direct defiance of the advice of his stoutest followers and of his army. Yet the, if, yet the event had always proved him right until Munich. There, for the first time, he had been compelled to listen to contrary opinion and his own faith in his voice and his people's confidence in his judgment were for the first time shaken. And then this is what he said to Chamberlain. You guys still with me? Yes. Hitler said, you are the only man, he said bitterly to Chamberlain, to whom I have ever made a concession. God's got some intercessors praying, bend Hitler, bend Hitler, bend Hitler. And God bends.
bent Hitler. He, this dictator, this monster, it's hard to even talk about him. Because anytime you mention the name, it just automatically bring, brings in, you know, all this other stuff. But this is your history. It's a history lesson. We have to learn from this. They're praying. And while people are trying to make appeasement and compromise with him, even in that, God brings Hitler himself in under a prevailing influence that's louder and more influential than the demonic influence that he always listens to. He came under the influence of the intercessors. Now, history has an interesting evaluation of that moment. This is uh, one of those. It says the Munich Agreement became a byword for the futility of appeasing expansionist totalitarian states. Although it did buy time for the allies to increase their military preparedness. This is a fact. Because the desire for peace was so strong, Britain and the other allies had not geared up for war. They were completely and totally unprepared for the conflict that was knocking at their door. That's why the demons were saying, now, do it now, do it now. And the prayers of the intercessors delay an invasion. They halt it and it buys time so that it can be fought under better circumstances. Now the conflict was inevitable, but I want you to see yourself in this kind of storyline that as the world is gonna become increasingly volatile, we need to know the times and seasons. We need to have that Issachar anointing and know the direction that the nation should go we need prophetic insight that is valuable to leaders. It's Elisha telling the king of Israel, hey, don't go that way. And the king listens to it. And even if the conflict is unavoidable, I believe that, that we are in a window of time for the gospel to advance, that the intercessors have to buy time right now. There is no room for delay. And I'm, I'm just going to say this right now, guys, because it's, it's just been shocking to have to go through this because I've been the pro-life guy for so long to be shifting gears into what I'm doing next. It's, 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 it's rattled a support base in a sense. There's been no financial provision for this. Now, I'm thankful for the... God's people and how they funded a prayer movement to end abortion. But listen, we need a generation now that can fight the battles of the Lord that are about to come. And there has yet been a revelation upon the great benefactors right now that have the foresight to see what's necessary. Schools are needed to train and to teach. We need Psalm 2 benefactors right now. This is what Reese was facing. He said, we need immense resources to do this, to propel the gospel forward and to keep the doors open. Let it be so. I'm almost done. World War II began a year later when Hitler invaded Poland combined with the Soviet Union also invading Poland. Chamberlain was removed and Winston Churchill, the church on the hill, stepped into his divine moment. In two years time, the Battle of Britain was on. So you see that there was this moment in time. This is what the Antichrist spirit always wants to do. He's a usurper. He wants to change the times and the laws. He wants to, he wants to inspire his own timeline that is contrary to God's timeline. He wants to accelerate conflict before the missions movement is ready, before there's a generation of intercessors that are ready. We need to mobilize right now. See, God, has the, he, he reserves this right to himself that he presides over the times and seasons, but that Antichrist spirit is always trying to mess with them and to change laws, 
to restrict you and to restrict the gospel from going forth. Listen, there are doors that have to be kept open right now. We don't have any time to wait or delay. This isn't a plan that can be enacted two years from now. There may be a battle of Britain two years from now. There's, a, there's some binding and loosing that needs to be happening right now so that we can buy time so that there's a better circumstance and opportune time for us. So Reese and his team, they suffered devastating defeats. But you know what? They did stop the invasion of Britain. And they did stop the invasion of Moscow. And they did stop the invasion of Alexandria. And they did stop the invasion of Stalingrad. And they, God used them to pray strategically through the entire World War II time frame. But there were four battles specifically that they had to take responsibility for. And it was the Battle of Britain. And it was the battle over Moscow the battle over Alexandria and the battle over Stalingrad. After the war, a military commander wrote an analysis called Hitler's Four Blunders, the four mistakes Hitler made that spelled the doom of the Nazis. And in that book, he said Hitler failed to take Britain, he failed to take Moscow, he failed to take Alexandria and he failed to take Stalingrad. And because of those four failures, doom was spelled for the Nazis. And I see a great encouragement in this to fight the battles of the Lord. But listen, you don't have to fight every battle, but you better fight the ones that he gives you. Because there's so much that must be done and we can make a rationale for all of it, but you need to get into that Psalm 2 space and find out what is the engagement that God is demanding of you and of us. It may very well be that he puts you on the four things that actually spell doom for the enemy when it's all said and done. So again, I'll say this, we are now in parallel times to that of Reese Howes. Conflict is coming. In the church and in the prayer movement, we need wartime leaders, not peacetime appeasers. The, the desire for peace is never wrong, but you have to be able to discern the times and seasons that you're living in where you are made for such a time as this. And if, if conflicts, global conflict is knocking on the door. Like, I don't want to be a leftover peacetime appeaser who's still trying to cut a treaty with the enemy. And he has no intention of honoring that treaty. A year, Chamberlain came back waving that piece of paper and stood on the tarmac there in Britain as soon as he got off the plane and declared peace in our time. Scripture says, peace, peace, they say, when there is no peace. A year later, Hitler invades, he violates that treaty, invades Poland, World War II is on. Two years after that moment, he's turning his sights on Britain and Mussolini writes a letter to Hitler. Churchill record this, records this in his memoirs. Mussolini writes a letter to Hitler saying, finally, the time has come to thrash England. And all of the uh, army and planes that I promised you in Munich, I'm ready to send them right now. So even in that Munich moment, the conspiracy of the kings is cooking. Let us break off these bonds. Let's do something now. And the voice and the demons are saying, do it now, do it now. And the whole scene comes under, that scene of history comes under that Psalm 2 influence of Reese and those intercessors that were crying out and they bought time. And it didn't stop it, but it bent it. Do you see it? And Reese talks about this. It's like, it wasn't, it wouldn't have, they came to the revelation that it wouldn't have done to just push Hitler back into Germany. He, God made it known to Reese that he had to be completely and utterly destroyed, him and his Nazi system. 
And so a war was inevitable in, in that sense. But God was dictating the affairs of battlefields from the prayer room. And we know the outcome. Last thing. Am I okay on time? I think I'm, I think I'm right on time. We had another dream just last week, two weeks ago. What we're preparing to this initiative that we're going into right now to respond to what we feel like God's saying. Uh, in the dream, they heard a taunting voice say, fee fi fo fum You recognize that. It's that old children's fable, Jack and the Beanstalk about a giant, it's, he's a principality who lives in that second heaven's dimension. He has a castle in the sky. And Jack goes up that beanstalk and he goes up there and he makes three strikes. In the first strike, he takes a bag of gold. In the second strike, he takes the goose that lays the golden egg and in the third strike, he takes that harp. But the, the giant, this is fun, isn't it? The giant is aware that, that something's happening. And so what, what that reference is, is, the, is what the giant actually says in the, in the tale. He says, fee, fi, fo, fum. I smell the blood of an Englishman. And the guy who had the dream, he said he knew that the Englishman was Reese Howells. <laughs> be he alive or be he dead, I'll grind his bones to make my bread. It's the inverse of what Joshua said, that the giants are our bread. He's actually saying, no, I'm going to grind his bones, but it's the, it's the blood and the bread. As a, a principality, I think the dragon, I don't know. He's aware of the blood that Reese Howells had, the blood of Christ. And so there's this dimension right now that we're carrying into these, these strikes that I believe that are, that are gonna set the stage of these conflicts. The handling of the, the blood and the bread, Lou, is gonna be the very thing that that brings down the giants, that chops them down the axes at the root and they do not know it. Yes. And I'm not talking just about people. When I say dragon, I'm not talking about the Chinese people. I'm talking about principalities and powers and communist regimes that are holding people in darkness. You hear what I'm saying? Yes. Reese even said, they said, we love the German people. It's the land of the Reformation. But God has to deal with Hitler and the Nazi system that is holding sway over the whole world. And so that, you have to kind of come up in your spiritual maturity to be able to grasp that, that the gospel's going to the people in the dark places where these battles must be fought. And so this is what is said of them. In Rizal's intercessor, their prayers became strategic. They must face and fight the enemy wherever he was, opposing freedom to evangelize. God was preparing an instrument, a company, to fight world battles on their knees. Let me just pray for us. Father, we just respond right now and we thank you, God, that we have been made for such a time as this, that we are not accidents, that we didn't just fall out into this moment in time and you've been surprised by it all. No, Lord, you prepared us because you knew the end from the beginning and you are our author and finisher in faith. So Lord, you've put us here and you've even brought us together in this room today for this very purpose, God, that we would come up through that open door, we would come up. We ask you, catch us up into that Psalm 2 dimension where even Isaiah was there and he saw you and he saw the train of your robe and the thresholds are shaking 
And he eavesdropped on what was being said there. And then he participated and said, send me. God, we want to be caught up into that same dimension. God, where you are presiding over the affairs of man. The Revelation 4 and 5. Lamb who was slain, but now the only one worthy to take the scroll and open its seals. Oh God, we want to sing that new song that releases the judgments that are written. Psalm 149, the, the new song that we hear sung in Revelation 5 and 4, 4 and 5. God, the, the, to break the seals and writ, uh, release the judgments that are written. God, we want the heaven strategies right now. I just pray right now for heaven strategies to come on this company. Dreams from heaven, dreams and visions, prophetic utterances, words of knowledge, not just for somebody who's sick. We know that's good, but God, words of knowledge over world leaders. God, that you would bring the strategies of heaven into our prayer rooms, and that we would begin to move in agreement with, Lord, the derision that you are bringing on those who would try to accelerate a demonic timeline in defiance of your times and seasons. God, we just want to come into agreement and alignment with that Psalm 2 dimension. I pray, bless my brothers and sisters here this morning, God, that we would respond rightly in this hour. In Jesus' name. Don't, let's not clap right now. This is not a clapping moment. This is, some of this may feel like this is way beyond me. I appreciate what he said. You don't have to be doing what he's doing and you don't know what he's going to do with a company that is going into these places with strike teams. But we can hear God to strike where God has called us to strike. And I was preaching the other day and I felt like the Lord, if you're not in a two or three ecclesia, you're not in the purposes of God. He said, this is what I'm going to build, two or three companies that have keys of divine revelation. And if you're, in, if you're not involved in that kind of ecclesia, you're really not in what God is building. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Find your ecclesia company. But this, what you just heard is a high level dimension. I, I, I am honored just to sit under it. Now you've got to understand what's going even now, you know, Wesley knows that on the night of power of the Muslim world, during their Ramadan, right? What day is it, Wesley? We'll find out. Over 110 million believers worldwide will be praying for the break-in of salvation to the Muslims. Millions joining in united prayer. On Pentecost Sunday, 110 plus million people will be praying on Pentecost for the outpouring of the Spirit and the salvation of Israel. And I will be with a company of people and they've asked me to lead communion. Because in a dream, the dream said I had access to the Temple Mount. It's the blood. When I see this, we should all be joining in these massive movements. But then there are also specialized strike teams, Green Berets, that fulfill their divine assignments. And today you might think, I can hardly get out of my own issues. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> well, then get a team of two or three and pray for your kids. And begin to take that place of authority for your children and applying the blood to the rebellion. Uh, don't get overwhelmed here. I, don't get overwhelmed. We were caught up into a high level general of intercession. But we don't have to be overwhelmed because we don't all have those kinds of spheres. But we could join with the masses on a day and praying, and then we could have our own little strike teams. Okay, anybody want to join this movement? That kind of company? Uh, no, seriously, it, again, I, I, it is such a sober moment that dictators are arising. And I feel like I just shared, David, were you going to share in the RAF today? Okay, I'll let David share. You don't want to miss the next session. Because, yeah. Just 
just a short video. I forgot I gave it to the, the sound team up there that will actually be the transition. I think that you will be good. If you could go ahead and play that video. But then I want to do one more thing. Thank you. We are in another time of the rising of the dictator. There in China, Iran, Turkey. This is why we need, once again, God to raise up Reese House communities. They were raised up in the times of the rising tide of the dictators. He actually believed that the Great Commission would not be fulfilled unless that community challenged the powers. Hitler, Stalin, the rising of the dictators that were restraining the movement of the gospel. So we're in the last stretch of reaching the unreached peoples. The battle is on. And every inch of ground we take will be challenged by the powers. God wants to raise up strike teams, an Air Force anointing. In every place where there is actually possibilities of war, we believe that fasting and prayer can shift things in the heavens. Never has so much been owed by so many to so few. This is what I want to do. Matt is on a strategic assignment that we can't even talk about. I'd like to take an offering. I would not like it to say that Reese Howells did not have financials, fin people to fund these kinds of high level strikes with divine intelligence. There is a company and you can find information in the back of all these young guys, stand up, SAFA, Spiritual Air Force Academy. They, and how many of them are you? David, uh, 14 of us right now, we're hoping to have 50 some as we move into this new year. If there are young intercessor, young who want to pray, I want you to go back to those tables and find out about them because the Lord told us to raise up an Air Force Academy in the spirit where the Air Force Academy lives. And I'll just share this. I, I was... I, 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 years ago, I came through Colorado Springs and I just, we were going to a thrift shop, my wife and my daughter and I, and we like thrift shops. And, 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 but I said, can we just please visit, go to the visitor center of the, US, uh, the Air Force? I go in there and I talked to my wife and my daughter and I said, I don't think it's an accident that I played basketball for the Messiah College Falcons about 1,500 miles away in Pennsylvania. The Messiah College Falcons, and this is the Air Force Academy Falcons. It's win the battle in the heavens. The moment I said that, my daughter said, look, a young lady walked right by us with a shirt that said the Messiah College Falcons. And I knew the Lord would say, I am going to raise up out of Colorado Springs what the natural things are. There is a spiritual dimension and there are young men and young women who are being prepared to fight these wars of the Lord in the last days and the church must recognize them. And I would love you to go back there to Safa, those, to contend booth. But tonight, I want to take, this morning, wherever it is, I, I would like to take an offering and fund Matt's movement to this next strike. Where do they write checks to? This is Esteban, my guy. Where, who do they write checks to? It'll all come to me. It will all go, this offering will all go to help fund Matt Lockett and these strategic strikes that he's doing right now, now meeting 12 hours a day with this army who are, are preparing themselves to go into harm's way, so to speak. Stand with me. I don't know if Jonathan's around my, my, my son on a keyboard, but I, I'd just like to pray right now. And maybe some of you could really help in, in amazing ways. Lord, I just want to thank you for this message. I know there's others here that are walking in these dimensions. I think of Wesley and Sandy Tullis and others. And 
we just thank you. But Lord, I'm asking that God, you would raise up this movement of schools like Reese House. Come on, pray with me, Lord. Loose Reese House and multiply Reese House movements and communities to challenge the powers. We ask today from Colorado Springs, make Colorado Springs a place with an anointing to shift in strategic warfare, the future of the nations in Jesus' name, I pray. And so right now, if you wanna write checks, I don't know how they do it, go to Lou Engel Ministries. The buckets go all around and also they can, you can scan the, the, the QR code there to give online, give by text. All of the money that we raise right now is gonna go directly to Matt. Right checks, the buckets are gonna go around, the buckets is gonna be at the, f at the back of the room as well. So, yes. Matt, thank you for, can we just thank God for, the, for that kind of message and understanding and revelation. Folks, we're coming out of our small mindedness. Oh, one last thing. I'm believing for 250,000 prayer hubs of women I've had a vision of a, a million women going to the mall. It will be the last stand to save America. And we, even now, we're, with a movement called Her Voice, we are seeking to mobilize women in small companies who will begin to turn back the darkness that is coming against the youth. Mothers roaring for breakthroughs in this nation. We want to release you now for a 10 minute break and then we're gonna come back for more. So fast, so you can receive my, ah, shut up, Lou. Bless you, thank you for being engaged in this amazing moment. Oh, the, yeah, don't wait, don't go. Wait for the offering. Go, John. You wanna lead us in a song, Satan? Come on, do it, just lead us in a song. Holy Spirit, I just pray you just brood over. Lord, lead them, lead these companies into small ecclesia companies. I do echo what Matt said, Lord, loose dreams. Wherever we go, we loose dreams, divine intelligence. Come on, raise up your hands to God. I desire, I ask. You should desire earnestly the gifts of prophecy. Receive in Jesus, receive in Jesus' name. I missed something, sorry. Andrew Whaling is one of our prophetic, in our prophetic community. I want him to just share. It's gonna take one or two minutes. Hang in there, listen. So in 2016, I had a dream where Francis Asbury. Matt, I want you to hear this. Say it again. Okay, 2016, I had a dream where Francis Asbury came to me. I didn't actually, I'd heard of him. I'd heard of the Asbury revival in the 70s. I didn't know much about Francis Asbury. But in the dream in 2016, he comes to me and he says, Andrew, it's time to go with me. And he says, you're gonna need these three books. And he hands me three books from Francis Frangipain. He gives me the spirit of Jezebel, the three battlegrounds. And I knew there was something special about this one. He says, this day we fight. By Francis Frangipane. I woke up out of that dream. The Lord began to talk to me about it. Fast forward. On the day of this most recent outpouring at Asbury, I have a dream. First one again, the first time since Asbury came to me again on the day of Asbury. Comes to me in a dream. Brings me into a room called the war room for the nation. There's a prophet in there and I don't, I'm not gonna say who it was, but I know that he's a voice for the nation. And the Bible is sitting there and right next to the Bible is this book, This Day We Fight. And the Asbury leads me in there and points at it and the prophet opens the book and I look at the book and every page is underlined. 
and I felt, I woke up from the dream wondering what it was about. And then later that day saw the outpouring at Asbury. And I felt the Lord said, this is the time marker we're in. I'm raising up a fight again. And let me just read this quick phrase from this book. It's from the scene of the Lord of the Rings. It's when Aragon in uh, Return of the King, he seeks to inspire his hopelessly outnumbered men against what seems like sure defeat. Hell's swarming legions have amassed before them and the courage of Aragon's fighters is weakening. And riding along the front lines of his gathered, but rather lowly army, he shouts, I see in your eyes the same fear that would take the heart of me. A day may come when the courage of men fails. And when we forsake our friends and break all bonds of fellowship, but it is not this day. This day we fight. And I feel it's a proclamation over what God is beginning to do in this hour. He's saying, it's not over. I'm just now beginning to awaken the warriors for this nation, for the nations of the earth. And I believe he is just raising an anthem over us to say, this day we fight, this day we fight. And I felt that in Matt's message. I just was like, you were championing us today. I felt it's not a day to cower back or become passive. This day we fight. So here's the thing you got to know about Asbury. Is he, he comes to the new world just as war is breaking out. He gets here right before the Revolutionary War. And so when the conflict came, all of the British preachers their loyalties were questioned and they all abandoned the new world. Asbury is the only one that stayed through the conflict and then he becomes the father of the church in the new world. I just wanna release this in the spirit because what are the chances on the day the spirit falls, he gets this dream, this day we fight. I want to announce something in the heavens. I want to proclaim something in the heavens and release this day right now. Lift your hands. Father, right now in the name of Jesus, with this divine dream encounter, we release a proclamation in the heavens with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on a new generation of young men and young women. We pronounce in the heavenly realms this day, this day we fight. We lose war in the heavens. Revelation 12, and they overcame him, hallelujah, by the blood of the lamb, the word of their testimony, and they loved not their life unto death. I believe this very moment, something is released in the spirit. Let's give praise to God. Lift your voice and hallelujah. This day, this day, Lord, this day. This day in America, whose angels, the armies in the heavens, in Jesus' name, hallelujah. Take a five to seven minute break. We'll be right back.